In this laboratory, we are interested in looking at pulses. And the reason we're interested in looking at them is because they are ubiquitous in communication systems and digital systems and radar systems and many other uses besides those. The other reason we're interested in them is they can sometimes be quite tricky to measure. And measurement and the use of measurement equipment is what this set of laboratories is really all about. It's a chance for you to use some laboratory equipment not just to get an answer but to get the right answer, that's to say an accurate answer but also to get a precise answer. That's to know that our answer is correct to within a certain number of decimal places or significant figures. Usually we prefer significant figures. And this is a very core skill for the engineer to be able to measure things properly because as an engineer you must make decisions based on the evidence in front of you, the facts. And if you can't actually measure what's going on, you won't have any facts to work with. In order to get you thinking about the things that we like you to think about, sort of engineering type things, and get your brain in the, in the mood for the lab, I've set a little problem. And the problem is shown in the pre-lab notes for your, your laboratory, um, and they're discussed a bit there. So everything that I'm about to say you can find in the lab sheet, but sometimes it's nice to have it actually spoken as well. You may not have seen an oscilloscope probe before, especially if you've joined us in the second year from overseas. So just in case, assuming you mostly have, this is what an oscilloscope probe looks like. This is the probe bit, and this is the bit that you hook onto your, your circuit. It's the bit you want to measure. And this is the, the crocodile clip which represents the ground. So you put this on the zero volts. You can actually take off the, the top and uh, leave them a sharp point a bit and you can pop that on the, poke that on the circuit instead of clipping onto a wire and this part is called the witch's hat because uh, witches are thought to wear quite pointy hats and uh, this looks like a hat you see yeah um, anyway don't lose this bit if you do take it off because uh, the probe is not nearly as useful without it as with it you can't clip it onto anything the other thing you'll find on this end of the probe the end that you hold is a little switch and this switch is in 10x or 1x. In 10x, the probe acts to divide voltages that you apply to this end by 10. So if I put 10 volts here, I'd only get 1 here. Um, assuming it was plugged into an oscilloscope and I was measuring that, that 1. If I had it on 1x and I put 10 volts here, I get 10 volts here as well. When it's in 10x mode, it acts as a potential divider. And we would like the probe to act on all frequencies evenly, or equally rather. And actually that's quite a tricky job for the probe to do because you say, oh it's a potential divider, it's got a couple of resistors in it, what's the problem? Well actually even resistors, quite small ones that you find on modern electronics, have a little capacitance in parallel with them. And the maker of the probe has to do something to mitigate the, the effect of all these extra little parasitic components. And the way they do that is they put a little extra capacitor in the, the bit that you plug into the, the actual oscilloscope and they make it tunable. So you can use a screwdriver in this little hole here to tweak the value of a capacitor inside the, inside the probe body to try to balance the probe to make it act on all frequencies even equally. So if you've been paying attention in your communication electronics or signals and systems, you will know that a pulse can be made up from odd harmonics. So you'd have a fundamental and a third and a fifth and a seventh and a ninth and so on and so forth. So if we say that the resistors inside this probe will act on the low frequencies, actually the capacitances will probably act more on the high frequencies. And we need to make sure that all frequencies are treated the same. Because if we put in a pulse with a flat top, we would expect to measure a pulse with a flat top of the right magnitude. And if we don't attend to the parasitic elements involved in the system, we won't get the measurement we expect to. And then we'll have evidence in front of us that isn't correct, and we might draw the wrong conclusions about what ought to be done. Every time you plug an oscilloscope probe into an oscilloscope, you must calibrate the probe. And you do that by hooking the, the hooky on bit onto the calibrate port or ring on the front of the oscilloscope and then you would tweak the capacitance here. Occasionally this capacitance can be found on, on this end. 
um, with a small screwdriver until you measure a pulse with a flat top. So let's draw what the, the circuit diagram with the probe and the oscilloscope look like. So I'm going to have a probe tip, this will be the tip, and it will have a capacitance here and resistance. And this resistance is 9 mega ohms. And there's a capacitance of a value that we don't know. And then there's a, a cabling capacitance. This is going to be the crocodile clip end. And uh, this could be CC, which could be the capacitance of the cable. So, just in case you're not familiar, I haven't seen it yet in a lecture somewhere, this cable is, is made up of two wires, one inside the other. Um, so one is a, a sort of a cylinder without any ends and the other is just a piece of wire that goes down the middle. And if you were on the inside wire, looking up towards the outside, all you'd be able to see is the cylinder. Um, and these two wires are separated by something insulating. So that looks like a capacitance. There is another capacitance, which is the one you are able to adjust. We'll call it CA. And that turns up in parallel with the cabling capacitance. So this CA is this capacitance that's just in there. It's a little tunable capacitance to tune it with a screwdriver. And then there is the oscilloscope, which is attached to this. This is just the probe. And then we have the oscilloscope, which I'll sort of maybe make a label here that says uh, probe. And the oscilloscope part looks like one mega ohm. And actually, inside the oscilloscope, there are some parasitic components as well. And we represent those mostly just by one capacitance, even though it's it's actually more complicated than that, we can sort of boil it down. And uh, it's usual to call that CI or C in. It doesn't really matter what the values in terms of numbers are, we can put these on because we know it's a 10 to 1 probe. You can buy a 100 to 1 probe, a 1,000 to 1 probe, and even a 10,000 to 1 probe, and the price tends to go up as the ratio goes as well. So we're going to put a pulse in here and we want to make sure that it looks the same as it did here in terms of its shape um, as it does when it gets to this end of things. We do that by adjusting CA. Now, if you were a high frequency and you come in here, would you rather have a big resistor or probably quite a small capacitance, but remember you're a high frequency. So the impedance of that capacitance will be relatively small because uh, impedance of capacitance is 1 upon 2 times pi times f times c. f is pretty big, even if c is quite moderate. The impedance of this is probably lower than that, so you most likely choose the capacitance. Similar arguments up here. That capacitance, that capacitance, that capacitance, they're all in parallel with each other. So they all just become one capacitance, part of which you can tune. So, high frequencies will probably choose this capacitor and these three, and you'll end up with a ratio of that to the three capacitors. Whereas a lower frequency, or DC, doesn't see the capacitors really, they're very, very high impedance indeed, and it would much rather take even a 9 mega ohm resistor over some very, very high value of impedance. And you'd end up in a ratio of, of 1 over 9 plus 1, which is 10 which is just a potential divider. So there's this resistive potential divider, but there's also this capacitive potential divider as well, which is that and, and those three. So bearing that in mind, let's draw a pulse and see what our possible outcomes are. So we can have some axes, maybe. And um, we'll draw our 
and a pulsing in blue. So we have our pulse, and there are three outcomes really. There is the outcome where you calibrated the probe according to how you have calibrated it in Workstation 1 in the first year, um, or perhaps at school or, or somewhere else, and you have tweaked this, this capacitance in here with a screwdriver having clipped this on, this bit onto the, the calibrate and you've got it so that it looks perfect. You have a square wave going in and on the oscilloscope screen you end up with a square wave and uh, it looks just like your input. There are two other possibilities however. One is that the capacitance is too big. So this capacitor in here you didn't tune it properly or you didn't bother to tune it at all or you didn't even realise that you had to tune it. And the, the capacitance is too big or too small, we don't know which, you can't tell by looking at it, and you get one of two results. Now you might get a result that looks a bit like this, or you might get a result that looks a bit like this. Now, what I'd like to know from you is, which one of these, green or red, so red is this one, green is that one, which of them is capacitance that you can tune, the capacitance which is inside here, is too small? Which of these is the capacitance is too small, and which of them is the capacitance is too big? I'd like you to work it out using the power of your mind. Um, and your skills of deduction. Deduction is so important because it gives us evidence and evidence allows us to make decisions as engineers. There is some notes on the sheet, the laboratory sheet, which can help you make your decision. But it doesn't really matter if you don't get it right. What I'm more interested in is to see that you're thinking about these sorts of problems and having a decent stab at it. Because these sort of um, these skills, deduction, induction, reasoning, they all take time to develop and you can only develop them through practice. Now most of the laboratory actually isn't involved with this sort of thing, this is a sort of warm-up exercise. The majority of the laboratory actually is about RC circuits. So you'll be building some just very simple first order, one resistor, one capacitor, and measuring some properties of that circuit. And there's a pretty good chance we won't tell you certain things like the values of some capacitors and the idea is that you will have to use your measurements and your skills of reasoning to figure out the things that we don't tell you and convince one of your demonstrators of the fact that you've got a decent reason and that it's probably the right number. Now a lot of this will be done on a board that looks something like this. And this is the amplifier laboratory board on the uh, National Instruments Elvis uh, unit and the amplifier board only derives its uh, plus or minus 15 volt power supplies from the Elvis which you will need in uh, day two and day three of the amplifier lab. You could use the Elvis's uh, function generator and oscilloscope to look at various points on the board and um, some have been connected up underneath and if you're very swift especially in day three you can have um, some interesting experiments of your own, having finished what's on the lab sheet, looking at various things like power dissipation in certain transistors and, and that sort of thing. But in day one, you will only require this part here, where that white line is. There are several other things which are of interest. You plug in the external function generator here, and it comes out at this pin here. So this is the 
The middle pin of this BNC connector is here and the outside goes to ground, which is most of the board that isn't connected to anything else. Um, so all this green stuff here, underneath it's all ground. So you'll need to solder this pin to this pin, which will give you access to this stepped attenuator. And the stepped attenuator circuit diagram is shown here, it's also shown in your lab sheet. And we have a resistor at the bottom of this potential divider and several resistors at the top, which we can select using this switch. So we have uh, straight through, or zero ohms, and then we've got uh, 10 to 1, 100 to 1, 1000 to 1. So we can do it in decades. If it's all the way to the left, that's to say turned that way, all the way around, it's on the straight through or one to one. If it's turned all the way to the right, it's on the thousand to one. The output of the potential divider comes out here. And you will solder it on day one to probably this pin or this pin. And these two are connected together. You can tell they're connected together because of the white line uh, between them and also you can actually see the copper track under the, uh, on the top surface of the board. The point of the stepped attenuator is to allow you to make the input from the external function generator smaller than you otherwise would be able to. It's a good idea to get in the habit of using it because you'll need it on day two and day three. So having managed to solder a connection from there to there and there to there or there to there, you'll build your little circuit, RC circuit, in this bit here. All of these pins here, these four, are connected to the middle of this BNC connector, which is your output, and you'll take that off to an oscilloscope if you're not using a probe. And part of day one of the Amplifiers Laboratory is comparing the effectiveness of a probe with just a BNC cable, normal one-to-one -one cable. Probes are made and sold for reasons beyond just another way for a company to make money. They do actually have some performance benefits. Part of day one is finding out what those are and why they're necessary. All of these pins, these five, are all connected to the ground, shown by the ground symbol and the little white line that connects them. And they are also all connected to the outside of this BNC connector and the outside of this BNC connector and everywhere else which is ground on the board. So most likely in experiment one you'll have a resistor from there to there and a capacitor from one of these to one of those. Um, and we'll be asking you to find out something about the capacitor which you don't know. Most of the experiments in day one follow similar lines. Um, none of them use anything which is outside of this little box. Day two and day three involved with op amps and amplifiers, transistor amplifiers and that sort of thing. 